Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, for in it and through it you reveal yourself to us. Help us to hear you and to see you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you see it? What? What? <laughs> what do you mean, what? 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 Did you see it? I don't know. You're not sure. You don't know, because you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, then, let me tell you about it, because it was pretty amazing. You need to hear this. I hang out at the temple a lot. You know, I don't have a whole lot to do, so there's always something happening at the temple. So I'll go hang around at the temple. And the temple gets very exciting, especially around Passover time. That's because Passover is a really big festival, you know, and there are people coming in from all over the place. They come to Jerusalem to participate in the festival of Passover, and they come from everywhere, all over the place. Lots of people. And some of them really seem to have a handle on what's going on at the temple during this festival. Others know they ought to go, but they just don't seem to be real sure why, why they're there. They're, they're trying to, to follow the law. They're trying to do good things, but, but they're just not sure about it. But there are people of all kinds, and they flood Jerusalem. And it's very busy, and it's very noisy, and it's very crowded, especially at the temple, because there are things that happen at the temple as part of the festival. And it can be kind of exciting. Because you know, when all these people come in, there are lots of sacrifices that need to be made, and so there are animal sellers at the temple. And there are always some of them, but at Passover time, there's a lot of them. And that means there's a lot of cattle, and there's a lot of sheep, and there's a lot of doves, and there's a lot of animal sellers. And they're doing their thing so people can fulfill the law. Well, you can imagine all those extra animals. It does make it noisy. It does make it a little more crowded. And it doesn't always smell wonderful. But that's what happens at the temple. And not only are there extra animal sellers, we need extra money changers as well. Because, you know, every sacrifice that's made, the, the temple tax needs to be paid, but it needs to be paid in Jewish money. And most of these folks are coming with that money the Romans make us use, and so we have to exchange that. And it has to be exchanged into Jewish money to pay the temple tax. So that means we need a lot more of these money changers. Now, as I've watched these guys, I periodically get the sense that not all of these money changers are on the up and up, if you know what I mean. And that may also be the case with some of these additional animal sellers that come in to sell their animals for sacrifice. But all this is going on at the temple. And at Passover, it's very crowded. And people are there from everywhere. Now, from year to year, it kind of goes the same. We know that there will be more people. We know that there will be more animals. We know that there will be all this extra stuff. But that's the way it is at Passover. That's what happens at the temple. And so everybody just kind of accepts it. That's what happens. That's the status quo. It just goes on that way. Except for this year. This year was different. This year was the really exciting year. This year, as people began to arrive, they were talking about some guy that they had become aware of, especially those who came from the north, up in the area of Galilee. They were talking about this guy that was doing signs. That's what they called them, signs. Kind of miraculous things. And they, they wondered if this guy... Some people called him Jesus. 
They wondered if he was going to be coming to Jerusalem for Passover. And so there was this buzz that was kind of going around through the people. Is he going to be here? Have you seen him yet? Well, I don't know, but maybe he'll show up. So there was a buzz that isn't normally there because of this guy they called Jesus. But one day, as I was just hanging out at the temple, this guy showed up, and he didn't look all that different from anybody else, except for the look in his eye. He had this look in his eye that was pretty sharp, like he was really looking around to see what was going on at the temple. He was checking it out. He was evaluating what was happening. And I got the feeling, just by looking at his face, that he wasn't really happy with what he was seeing there. He was really giving it an intense look. So I was trying to watch him. I wasn't real close. But, but then he kind of seemed to just fade into the crowd, because there were a lot of people. And I, I lost him for a few moments. And I, I didn't know what he was going to do. I thought, well, maybe that's nobody special. But the look in his eyes said something was different about him. He just kind of faded away. But all of a sudden, there was this commotion. People started yelling. People started jumping around. And there he was. He had gone, and he'd gotten a whip of some kind. And he was swinging that whip around. And you should have seen the people jump. He was making a move. And he headed straight for those animal sellers. And you should have seen the look in their eyes. What is going to happen? And he spooked the animals, and pretty soon we've got cattle and sheep running all over the place. And those animal sellers didn't know if they should try to stop what this guy was doing or chase their animals down, because they were going everywhere. They really didn't know what to do, but they did know they didn't want to feel that whip. So they got out of the way. And it was a big commotion. It was just chaos for a few minutes. That wasn't all that he did. For as soon as he got all those animal sellers and all their animals running around, he headed for those money changers. He grabbed their coins and threw them around. He knocked their tables over, and they didn't know what to do either, except stay away from that whip. And you know, a really odd thing about this was, this guy hadn't said anything yet. He'd just been swinging that whip around. But then he turned to look at the dove sellers. And their eyes got big. And he headed for them, swinging that whip, and they jumped up. And he did now say something. He said, get those things out of here. They didn't know what to do. But he didn't stop there. He went further than that. He added a statement to his command to those dove sellers. He said, don't make my father's house a marketplace. My father's house. Well, as soon as he said that, he kind of stopped. He let the whip drop. And he just stood there. He was a little bit out of breath, as you can imagine. He was pretty active there for a while. Some other people were out of breath, too. But he just stopped. And he looked around to see what was going on. And the commotion began to die down a little bit. The dust began to settle. Because he'd really caught the attention of everybody there with his statement about my father's house. What did he mean by that? What did he mean, my father's house? This was the temple. It belonged to everybody. What did he mean by that? Was he drawing, trying to draw some connection back to Abraham or, or perhaps King David? Or, you know, Herod was the one building this temple. Nobody really understood what he meant by that statement. It was kind of a, a mystery to everybody. As people were trying to figure out what that meant, some of the authorities showed up. 
Not only had this guy gotten the attention of everybody who was selling animals and changing money, he'd gotten the attention of the authorities, as you might guess. And they showed up, and they wanted an explanation. And they wanted it right now. They said, you need to give us a sign that you have some authority to do this. They wanted an explanation. Now, when, when this guy answered the question, I thought he was just trying to avoid the question because his response didn't make sense to me. It didn't sound like he was answering the question they asked because he said, tear down this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. What? What, what is that? I don't think that's what those authorities had in mind when they asked the question. And I don't think they understood what he said because they responded, this temple? It's been under construction for 46 years. And you think you can raise it in three days? Come on! Jesus, I would concluded this was Jesus. This was the one they were talking about. Jesus looked at them for a minute and walked away. Melted into the crowd and walked away. Now there are some people who say he's still around. There are some people who say he's, he's still in Jerusalem somewhere, but there are others who said, no, he's gone back to Galilee. But if he's gone back to Galilee, I hope he comes back to Jerusalem sometime. Because I'd like to see him again. I'd like to hear if he has anything else to say, because I don't think we understood what Jesus said to us that day. He may still be around, but I hope he comes back to the temple. I'd like to see him. We're in a season of Lent that directs us towards the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. But we have to pass through Friday before we get to Sunday. And when Jesus made a reference to those questioning him at the temple that day, he was talking about the body that was his, the temple that he was. And he was offering that temple, not only for those people back then, but for us today. This season of Lent is a season of hope for us because it brings with it the resurrection of our Savior, which opens up to us abundant life and eternal life. And so it is a season of hope. So where is the hope in what he was doing that day? And where is the hope that was in those commandments that God gave to those wandering in the wilderness? Well, those wandering in the wilderness had been wandering for about three months. The scriptures tell us three moons had come and gone, and they found themselves in the wilderness of Sinai, they had already received manna from God to keep them alive. They had already seen water coming from the rock. They had seen how God was providing for them. They had already begun to think at times, Moses, you've done nothing but bring us out here in the wilderness for us to die. And yet God was giving them hope. God was giving them food. God was giving them water. And now God was telling them through these commandments how he wanted them to live, how he wanted them to be in relationship with him, and how he wanted them to be in relationship with one another. He was providing hope for them, helping them realize he was not just abandoning them in the desert, 
but had plans for them, had a future for them. And so these commandments now on top of water and food became an additional sign of hope that God wanted them to keep going, to keep on, that he had things in store for them. And so they had hope. When Jesus showed up at the temple that day, things had become distorted. The people weren't doing everything the way that God wanted them to, and so their relationship to God had become distorted. Their relationship to one another had become distorted, and even some of the things that were going on at the temple had become distorted. And so Jesus was there to say, no, this is not how it ought to be. And so he cleansed the temple on that day and gave the people hope that things could be brought back into the way God wanted them and that he was the one that was going to do it and he was going to do it by offering his very life that we could have eternal life with God. He was going to offer his body to die so that we can live. Now the scripture that Amy read for us tells us that the, even the disciples didn't really understand what Jesus was saying until he had been resurrected. And then they understood. Then they knew what Jesus was saying on that day. And they knew that he was giving them hope that day. That God still wanted them. That God loved them more than they knew. And he was going to offer his life that would be raised in three days, that we all might enjoy abundant and eternal life. So just as God was offering hope to those wanderers in the wilderness, Jesus was offering hope on this day that he was going to make the relationship with God right for us, that he was going to offer himself for us, that we might have life. And so in this season of Lent, this season of hope, we can look to Jesus as the one who brings that hope, as the one who brings that salvation, as the one who brings that eternal life for us. And he did it through offering his body. But that body was raised, brought back to life, and in the process conquered death itself for us. Our hope is in Jesus. And no matter how distorted some of our relationships may become or how distorted things in our lives may become, perhaps how hopeless in our lives things may become, Jesus offers hope for us to keep going. That he loves us. That he wants us to experience that abundant and eternal life that he died to give us. That's the hope that Jesus offers. And we experience that most keenly in this season of Lent. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your Son who brings us hope. We thank you for your never-ending love for us. We pray that you will keep that hope alive within each of us, not just today, not just during this season of Lent, but throughout all of our days ahead. And we pray this in his name. Amen. <laughs>